Behind every amazing flavor is an amazing human who has perfected their craft. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. A behind the scenes look at new flavors and the chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders who create them with your host, Emmanuel. Hi there, welcome to episode 58 of the Flavors Unknown podcast. Today, my guest is Chef Bryce Schumann of the acclaimed Bethany in New York City that got three stars from the New York Times and one Michelin star and was named in 2015 Food and Wine Magazine Best New Chef. Chef Bryce Schumann talked about his early taste experience when he was a kid traveling with his parents from Costa Rica to the Arctic. He shares the lesson learned at Rubicon and Eleven Madison Park, and he describes his creative process with his team at Bethany in New York City. I am your host, Emmanuel LaRoche, and if you are new to this podcast, I have been in the food industry for more than 20 years, both in Europe and in the US, and every other week, I have a conversation with trending chef, pastry chefs, and mixologists around the country. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Flavors Unknown, and you can find the show notes from this episode and all the other episodes on the website flavorsunknown.com. And now, here is my conversation with Chef Bryce Schumann. Hi, Chef. Uh, Welcome to uh, Flavors Unknown. I'm really excited to have you on the show. Thank you for having me here. Really great to be here. You travel quite a bit when you were young. I think that your mom was an anthropologist, which is really interesting already, but, you know, as, as a job. So you have traveled in all of different places and you have been exposed, I guess, to a lot of interesting food when you were young. So I, I was curious if you could, sh- you know, start sharing some of those experiences <laughs> with us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, humans, I mean, we, I guess we, we all grow up, you know, with different life experiences and like you know we all have so many different things to share and you know if you grow up in california or you know maybe you grew up eating just the best fish tacos on the planet or like you know or if you're in the northeast you had like the most amazing clam bakes or you know i i don't know and as a kid, I just, you know, I am from North Carolina originally, too. And I like, I did ha- have some like early pig picking memories and stuff like that. But my mom, as doing her dissertation, decided to do her dissertation on the seal hunting and the protection of the seal population and the Inuit, uh, you know, community and how the seal, you know, seal was the, like the food, like the, their main food source or one of their main food source in, in the Inuit population of. So you, the, so you went to the Arctic then, correct? The, then yeah, with her? yeah. So, so we traveled to the Arctic and I guess the Canadian was a lot. There's a movement in the, in Canada to sort of outlaw seal hunting, I guess, at the time. And this would have sort of been a big blow to the Inuit community. So we lived up there for about a year. What kind of experience did you have? What kind of food? Because I'm sure it's really different (laughs) from North Carolina. (laughs) Seal. (laughs) I mean, seal was definitely on the menu. And seal is, you know, seal is a red meat, you know? I mean, it's aquatic, but it's a mammal, you know? It has a lot of fat on it, but it, it's also kind of lean and, uh, you know, and I remember going out on seal hunt, you dig a hole in the ice, a round hole in the ice, right? And then you build a big mound of snow and you hide behind this mound of snow. And then you just, everybody's still and you just wait. And you just wait. The seal's mammal, right, it needs to breathe oxygen. So the seal needs to come and come out and get air and they just wait until the seal pops out to get to get some air and get some sun you know and they just like just pick off the seal and then just take the seal and drag it back to their sled you know they drag it the seal back to camp and then 
you know, usually they just take the seal down right there and break it down into pieces. And, you know, people would sit around and you would just start eating right there. You just start to eat pieces of the seal. You'd take, you'd have some, some pieces of meat and some of the fat and you'd break off pieces and put pieces aside to, to take back to town. And, um, you know, set aside the hide and eventually what they would do is they'd stretch the hide and stretch it and tan it for clothes. You'd make jacket, you'd make jackets and boots and things like that out of seal skin. You know, bones were used for to- for tools, for handles, for the ulus, for the knives and for like, for, um, even for, for like little, ga- they'd make games and things out of Every piece was used. Even a cup of the blood was passed around, and they drink uh, some of the fresh blood. How old were you at that time? Uh, I was five and six. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. So it's an interesting experience. It, you know, it's very irony, so, somewhat uh, like kind of almost kind of fishy, but like, but it was definitely like red meat. You know, I preferred caribou. You know, tell you the truth, at that age, I really liked the caribou. And I never had caribou fresh and raw like that because I think they had to go further out to go get the caribou. And like, but the, whenever I had caribou, it was always frozen and like sort of shaved into sheets and kind of like frozen just with salt on it. I had always had frozen raw caribou with salt on it. And that was like one of my favorite snacks. Wow. That's really um, then develop your... Um Taste and buds, uh, your taste buds, like, uh, you know, differently from, you know, other kids for sure. <laughs> yeah, it was, it helped me to open my mind to try different things. You know, it was, I knew the things, the foods that I didn't like. And those foods were like the frozen brick of squash in the vegetable aisle, you know, the, like the brick of frozen squash, the puree, whatever, like that is disgusting. The frozen Brussels sprouts so gross you know what i mean that like for some reason my mom who who also had a degree in nutrition would just steam and put on the plate you know with no salt and no butter and no like <laughs> nothing like <laughs> like because she thought it was just it's just more healthy it was disgusting you know and you know why because it is disgusting nobody wants to eat that like nobody wants to eat a, a frozen overcooked brussels sprout that was steamed you know those were the foods that I didn't didn't like, you know. And did you go to other places, you know, with your parents or, you know? We did. We went, uh, uh, let's see, it was, we did go to this place called Mojlos, which was like a, a little island off of Crete. And we were there for, we were there just there for a little over a month for doing a, like a, on a Minoan dig. And I remember there having like just the most amazing like this little red fish i think it was just probably like red mullet or something like that but like the way they're cooking it and it was they're frying it whole and like you just eat the whole fish you know like you just eat the bones the head the just everything you just ah just with some lemon on it that's another kind of food life experience that i'm just i've just been trying to recreate that I have not been able to find anywhere. To me, it's what a benchmark, you know, like there's, there's certain benchmarks that I have in, in this life. Like, you know, there's, there's a certain pork chop. When I have that pork chop, I'm like, this is the best pork chop I've ever had. And every time I have that pork chop, I'm like, yep, this is it again. I, I have yet to try a better pork chop or like a certain piece of beef. Like this is the best piece of beef or like this is the best strawberry. Every time I have this strawberry, I know it's the best strawberry. I, I've tried other strawberries, and every time I eat this strawberry, I know it's the best strawberry. This little red fish, like, I just remember it. I've yet to try, like... And it became the benchmark for you, yeah. F- it, well, it's like it, the benchmark for little crispy red fish. Like, I just mm-hmm. haven't tried... Like, no, 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 I just, I just, it's something I want to try again. I've never been able to find it again. Did you have, like, something similar when it comes to... Uh, I'm thinking tropical fruit, because I think that you went to Costa Rica as well, correct? So, yeah, yeah. So do you uh, have that uh, benchmark, you know, when it comes to tropical foods, you know, there? Oh, you know, there... Well, there I remember. So this is funny, though. One thing I remember, I was on a bus or something, and we were traveling between San Juan and like 
this place in the jungle called La Pacifica where we were staying. And this woman, or they were, or the, somebody was selling these things in the back of a bus, I guess. And it was just uh, like an orange. And I don't know if they would just like squish the orange up or something. And then they would just take a straw and just like jam the straw right into the orange. And somehow you would just sip it and suck the juice out of the, the orange. And I've never seen this ever again, anywhere. I've never seen it in the United States. I don't know if I, would, if I dreamed this up if, or <laughs> if, if, if this is just like something that I've made up in my mind. But I swear I remember this and I swear that I had it. I swear I remember it being delicious. but. There, to me, it was more about the, like, the sort of the wildlife and the creatures and the animals. And, like, you know, we were staying, we were in the rainforest, and it was, uh, you know, staying in just this, like, little cottage. And every night, it was just... The, Monkeys, I'm guessing. Uh, the, the, <laughs> ce the, ce the ceilings <laughs> and the roof. The, our ceilings, so that, uh, you know, when you go to bed, are just, like, covered in geckos. Yep. Sort of lizards running around everywhere. Where you wake up in the morning, there's enormous poisonous snakes curled up on your front doorstep. And like, you know, Jay, who is our, one of our companions, would he would go and get them, pick them up with a stick and like shove them in a bag and take them to the zoo or whatever. And like, they're traipsing out into the, into the jungle to study howler, howler monkeys. And um, so they had this machine that would um, take the paw of the howlers and then spit it back out at them so it would bring the, bring them closer and then they'd just try to observe them and see what was going on i guess and uh yeah it was it was crazy it was crazy experience yeah and and was cooking like important part of uh, your your parent education my mother was a good cook and she was cooking was important to her I don't think that, you know, she was, she was not teaching me a lot of cooking. So what gets you into uh, like, like, like cooking and, and what, you know, compel you then to, uh, to become a chef after? Uh, you know, what compelled me to be a chef was that I needed a job. At first I wanted to be an actor. I went to an acting school and then I got out of that and then, uh, I, yeah, I needed a job, and I watched, started washing dishes. I loved washing dishes, by the way. Washing dishes is, is awesome. It's just like all you do is like organize things and tidy things up and put things in a row and like make things tidy and you know nobody <laughs> nobody messes with you. You know what I mean? Nobody's you know just have very little responsibility. <laughs> like and um, I, you know I moved to, up really. Rather quickly, two and a half years later, I was like the chef de cuisine of the restaurant. Then I decided to go to culinary school. Yeah, I went to culinary school and then and I'm moving from eastern North Carolina to San Francisco to go to culinary school. So it was kind of a pretty much a big jump there culturally and um, uh, worked at Post Rio, which was Wolfgang Puck's place. And then which was a, a great experience for me while I was in, while I was in culinary school. Really uh, worked for worked for and with some really great guys doing like three you know three hundred covers a night and cooking just great California cuisine or a place that like made its own bread and you know all that kind of stuff it was really nice and then ended up going to uh, Rubicon and working for Stuart Stuart Brioza and Nicole Krasinski who I really love and I have so much respect for. Uh, and um, I just uh, really, really enjoyed working for them. They're, you know, they're just like have a really uh, special place in my heart. And what did you learn from them? Stuart really was like um, was like the first chef who who really taught and ingrained recipes <laughs> into my head with like with really recipes with like grams and like and using a scale and it being consistent and like really lining things up in nice little neat containers and separating things with 
hotels and organization and like really making things, you know, I mean, at Postrio, it, there was, it was to a small degree, but like it was a little bit more cowboy style, you know, with Stuart, things were much more, things were more structured and more clean and much more, um, you know, things were much more all ducks in a row. But he did it, he did it without being overbearing or without being aggressive or without being uh, a tyrant, without being some sort of tyrant. He, he, he kept everything very tight. He, he was very, he was very assertive, got his, uh, always got his point across and always got exactly what he needed from the team and getting a lot of respect you know, uh, while being calm and uh, calm and well-mannered. And did you learn something different from Nicole then? From her, it was, she was just very creative. I, what I learned from her is, is the ability to, you know, use savory ingredients in sweet desserts. And like that was the first really exposure to that that I had had. Do you have um, an example to share uh, with us? Oh yeah, she had this dessert that you know she she would would laugh you know when I said it because it's Santa Rosa plum cake with uh, olive oil ice cream and pecorino cheese. It was a knockout. It was um, I mean just a home run, and it was an Arbequina olive oil ice cream that was the olive oil ice cream was basically green because the olive oil was green and. The olive oil ice cream tastes like jasmine. It was just, the olive oil was so floral. It was nuts. And the olive oil ice cream was essentially a frozen mayonnaise, <laughs> you know? And then the plum cake was just, I don't know if it was a financier. with like layers of jam or what, I can't remember exactly. It was, or it was made with cornmeal. It was like a cornmeal financier with like layers of with jam or something like that. And then shaved pecorino and black pepper, and there was watercress on it. It was just, oh, and the watercress was from this farm called Sausalito Springs. It has this really nice, just like tender watercress that wasn't too bitter and had, and has blossoms on it for like three quarters of the year. California, you know, just like everything grows and blooms all the time. <laughs> and then even with that, you decided that you wanted to move like to on the other side of the country because you went to uh, New York, correct? And uh, work at um, you know, 11 Medicine Park. Well, with... first I moved to Delaware, oh, uh, Delaware for, a little first, okay. while, for a little bit. I moved to Delaware for a little bit too. Well, because I wanted to travel in Europe. So my, and I did, I, I, I went to Delaware to, uh, and I worked actually, I, Moved to Delaware for just a little bit and to uh, Lewis Rehoboth, Del uh, Dewey area. I worked in a bar and bar backing for a summer and then saved that money and traveled in Europe. And along the way, I ended up cooking in a, like, a, cooked, it, cooked in a uh, two star restaurant in Brussels called Le Chalet de la Forêt, which was great. And it was like all in French, you know, just uh, like in the middle of uh, cr the Christmas season, you know, like f hunters were bringing like a uh, whole wild hare in the back and we're like skinning the hare in the, in the shed out back. And like, it, it was just uh, like, you know, like one slice behind the neck and like one person grabs one side, one person grabs the other side and just like pull the hair. And then uh, roasting um, snipe on the rotisserie and then taking the guts out and passing the guts through a tammy and spreading it in on toast. And like, I tell you what, my French is not very good. It, it, I mean, it's terrible. <laughs> when I say not good, I mean bad. And like, thank goodness I was the, I was on Chimatier on the meat station and the meat roast was Flemish. And, you know, if, if I was next to a French speaking Belgian, I would have been sunk because. <laughs> yeah, because no effort. No, they would make no effort, you know, to speak English with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because the French speaking Belgians don't speak any English. English, yeah. <laughs> But the Flemish, you know. They, yeah, they do. Yeah, because nobody speaks Flemish. Nobody speaks Dutch, 
you know, yeah. like, cause so, so the Flemish have to speak like seven languages, you know, they speak like Italian, French, German, Dutch, like English, every, yep. yeah, English, everything. So that saved you a little bit. Yes. Oh yeah. It saved my life. <laughs> and so, you know, so like, because there was no tickets and the maitre d' would just walk in and announce the menu in French yeah. and hand the ticket to the chef and that's it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and if you didn't get it, that's it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I tell you what, like Cote, Cote de Port and Cote, Cote de Vaux yeah. sa- sound very similar. Uh, okay. To yes. like to my ear, if I didn't get it right, if I didn't, if I, it was, Peter Jan was his name. If, if I, if it, thank God for Peter Jan. Oh man. <laughs> 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 and, and, so how, how long did you stay there? Oh, it was about two months. And about then, two months, uh, okay. Yeah. So then after that, we left and we went down to Spain and traveled in Spain. And Where do you go in Spain? Which oh, part of? Got, oh, we went just about as south, far south as we could go. We, I mean, we traveled. We wanted to get somewhere warmer because Brussels, sure. Brussels <laughs> is just miserable. And like <laughs> in, during that time of year. And, you know, I was getting up, you know, I was getting up. You know, it's six, seven in the morning to get a, a, a car to get to the restaurant at eight, you know, and I was getting home at midnight or a little after, you know, five days a week. And so doing that for two months, I was like in the middle of winter in Brussels. I was just, I was like, I'm ready. I'm done with this. <laughs> get me out of here. <laughs> Okay, and then after Sp- this is after Spain that you went um, you went to uh, so, New okay, York. Then, so so no, so I went back to um, to Delaware, and I went to go to work at this bar that that I was bar backing at, and we started working there to save money to move to New York. Uh-huh. And um, is it is it where you met uh, uh, Harry? Come Harry? On. No, so I, I hadn't met Harry yet, and I went to go work at this bar, right? And so we went and started working there. And then one night, this guy burnt the place to the ground. He burnt it down. He burnt our job to the ground. They kicked him out of the bar one night. And then the guy got mad and came back and he burnt the place to the ground. So I was like, I was like well, that was our job. That was our, yeah. you know, that Gone. was our money. Bye. Yeah. Well, so they ended up rebuilding the bar, right? And then it burnt to the ground again. What's going on? <laughs> I know it's a true story. It burnt to the ground twice. So I needed a job and I was like, okay, well maybe I'll cook instead of bar back. So I started, I was like, well, what's the best restaurant in town? And I was asking around and they were like, well, this place called Naj on the highway. And so I went and I, I went into the restaurant and I, they, uh, introduced me to the chef and this chef's name was Hari Cameron. And so I, I started working there and Hari and I had a crazy summer working side by side, doing some just really in, insane events. I swear that they achieved and accomplished the most incredible event calendar season out of that kitchen that uh, I would have thought impossible. And it was achieved and executed with such just absolute, uh, you know, finesse. And Hari and I became, you know, fast friends. And, uh, and t- you know, to this day, I uh, rely on Hari for, you know, advice and, um, and reach out to him to say hi. And every time I, you know, I get a chance, I go down to Rehoboth, Rehoboth to see yeah, him and yep. say hello. And I, I, I love him. And, and Steph and uh, yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah, really, really That's good man. So, so from there you went to um, New York. So I, I'm trying to get you to New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're getting, me. yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So then I ended up moving to New York, and here I we so we ended up moving to New York, and then this is 2007, and I stashed around at the restaurants, and and I, you know, think I felt like 11 Madison Park was really. The best experience that I had, I felt just felt like like the intensity was just it was the best. I was really where it was at as far as the level of what it felt like in the kitchen. It really felt like it was the place. 
how long did you stay there? Like in, six, in the head of an- six years. Six, six years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I was a line cook for about two months, and then I was a, and then I was a sous chef, and then I was a sous chef on like every station, everywhere, and then and then I was executive sous chef for a couple of years, and then ended up uh, ended up leaving. But uh, you know, at EMP, I we you know we I traveled with chef. You know, we Daniel we, home. Yeah. Yep. We we traveled all over the place. I helped write I helped write two cookbooks with mm-hmm. um, with him. And you were there when uh, the restaurant got the three Michelin stars, correct? Yeah, was there for four stars yeah. and for three four stars. Four stars for New York, yep, yeah. Yeah. Three star Michelin. So how was that experience? I'm I'm guessing it's it was insane, right? In yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, it was uh Quite a journey to to yeah. watch the restaurant go from where it was when I started in 2007 to see it climb and to get the four stars and then to get the three stars and then to, it went from zero to one to three stars. But which is interesting is that you had as well your own progression, you know, within that restaurant when you were describing before. So for maybe you know young chefs that are listening to the show, what would be your advice? Because you have, have you had like this great, you know, progression in like the six years you were there, you know, in this very high end, uh, you know, or restaurant. So what's what's the, let's say, the advice that you can, you know, give to um, you know, young cooks or young chefs? You know, I, what I would say is first decide what your goal, what your goal is, what is your your absolute goal, and decide what kind of a chef you want to be, and say, okay, this is the type of chef that I want to be, and then. From there, you say, okay, well, how am I going to achieve that? And, you know, is it through working at a restaurant or is it through working at a somewhere else or what is it, you know? And then if it's working at a restaurant, then you find what type of restaurant is it and then find the best ty- the best one of what that restaurant is, you know, and do your research, you know, go trail and at a few restaurants. And then you find out to yourself which one is the best. Don't let somebody else tell you. And you feel it out. And when you know, because you've been there, you know, then you take that job. And then no matter what, put, you know, put your head down and work your tail off and dedicate yourself, you know, for a number of years and learn from somebody, you know, get a mentor. Get a t- get a teacher. Have somebody teach you the teach you the way. And um, I think that there's something to say about like jumping around, you know, a little bit. I feel like I learned a little bit from from working at you know one place or, or one place or another place. But it's like if you work a year here or a year there or a year there or a year there, you better make sure you're doing different stuff. At each place that you go to, you know what I mean? Because it's very possible you could work a year in one restaurant and then go to another restaurant and just do the same job and then go to another restaurant and just do the same job and then go to another restaurant and just do the same job. And after like four or five years, you haven't learned or progressed at all. All you've done is the same job at five different restaurants. You know what I mean? It's like you've just been, you've just been a fish cook. You know, or you've just been a meat roaster, you've just been a line cook, basically. You haven't like done butchery at one restaurant and done, you know, baking at another restaurant. So that Daniel Hume was, um, you know, you consider him as a mentor as well when you were at uh, the 11 Madison Park? You know, I think what I learned from Daniel is that, you know, you have to be absolutely doggedly ruthless about your goals and your achievement of them and you can't let anything stand in the way and you know you have to set your goals and then you you have to you know shoot for them and then achieve and and then achieve them and uh you cannot back down i think that's uh that's number one so uh, after you know uh being an 11 medicine park then in 2013 you open your like the restaurant which is now closed but like a bethany in in new york city so can you describe a little bit for us that the concept 
you know, of the food in Bedani and it, yeah. how was it like almost like, the, you know, the, the, the achievements of everything that you have experienced and, you know, and learned before? Yeah, Bedani was a fine dining restaurant and originally it was a la carte offerings and with a great bar. You know, when we opened, we were really slow until we've got a three-star review in the New York Times. And then we were just crazy busy. We were packed. And the, it was an, we were an impossible table to get. You could not. We were just so crazy busy. And it was that year way for almost a year and a half. It was a great creative hub of energy you know we were just constantly thinking about about great ways of of serving food and drink and doing it in a comfortable yet you know fine dining way i loved the restaurant i loved working in the restaurant i loved the i, I really loved our our chef team and our our cooks and I love the I love the dining room staff also. I really do do. And everybody who worked there just put in so much time and energy and heart and like the cooks and the, the uh, sous chef team, especially when you know we were constantly thinking about food. We were constantly thinking about uh, the creative process. Like for the chef de parties, for instance, I would task them once a week. The chef de parties would have to put up a dish and. We give them we'd give them an ingredient and we'd say, okay, this week it's apples, or next week it's uh, broccoli, or next week it's uh, you know salsify, or next week it's you know, and then they would have to all come up with a dish centered around that ingredient, and they'd have a week to think about it, plan on it, you know, if they wanted to order an ingredient or whatever, that's fine, but they could put they'd practice it, they could refine their dish, they could. They could get advice, whatever. They could let somebody else taste it, you know, or it was every two weeks. Because at the following week, they'd put up the dish and then we would talk about it. And it, the sous chefs would come together to talk to the chef de parties. And it was a, it was a discussion and it was never about, nobody was allowed to say whether they liked it or didn't like it. People were only allowed to describe the dish. You were only allowed to say it's green, it's crunchy, it's smooth, it's brown, it's sparkly, it's sure. you know, like. But did you like, have like any other uh, like uh, criteria of selection? Because I'm guessing this was a way for you guys to foster, you know, creativity and, and innovation. So at, at the end, there was probably a selection process, correct? To you know, select maybe some of those dishes around one theme and move forward with it or improve it or, you know, and finally put something on the menu. That was the idea. And from then we would start to talk about choices and we'd say, okay, we'd talk about, okay, what was, what was your choice here? You, you, you chose to do this instead of this. You chose to do this instead of this. You chose to do this instead of this. And then we would start to say, okay, well, I think we're going to choose to go this way instead of this way. And then it was never about like, Oh, I like this. I hate this. I hate that. Or, or that. I don't like. I that. know what you mean. Sure. You know, but it always start started. It always started out about just discussing and describing the food. And so people, you know, it was more about we were more about observing, and pe people be became more about like observing the, what was actually on the plate rather than just taking their first impressions and saying oh, I hate this. Some interesting food came out of that, and then. We might say, okay, let's take this dish and keep on working on it and let's develop it into a dish and it, it'll go on the menu eventually. And sometimes we'd, we'd say, oh, yeah, this is great. Okay, throw it all in the garbage. Next week, we're working on salsa sure. beef. Okay. You know? okay. <laughs> so I have several questions for you here. The first one is you're talking about, you know, this week we are talking on working on Bursa Sprout, next week on Salsa So was it... The selection was based on the season and seasonality of the ingredients that you would, uh, had available from your purveyors? Yeah, 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 of course. I mean, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, we wouldn't work on, you know, we wouldn't be working on toma tomatoes in the middle of December. Then your creative approach 
was really anchored in collaboration because that's the uh, idea of absolutely a hundred percent and so, so i mean sometimes i mean i mean sometimes i would come to a lot of the times actually it's like we need a new tasting menu and i come to the sous chef meeting with the tasting menu and i'm like this is it and i will have it almost all written out basically with what i want and it may be it may be all the dishes and i know exactly what i want and and have it drawn out and and it'll be flavors but maybe some of the dishes may just be a combination of flavors and i'm not exactly sure what i want but i know i want this combination of flavors and some places i may leave blank because i'm not exactly sure what i want in there but i know it's a certain dish that needs to go there like it's a fish dish or it's a dessert amuse and then i'll come to the sous chef meeting and i'll say okay guys gals it'll be a this is what the new tasting menu is going to be you know this flavor this flavor this flavor you know george i need you to work on this dish this is what i envision Stephen, I need you to work on this dish. It's going to be this. Linda, I need you to work on this dish. It's going to be this. Tommy, I'm not quite sure what the dessert muse is going to be. I'm not quite sure. Maybe, maybe we, you know, use pineapples. Uh, I, I don't know. Like, let's talk about it later this afternoon. Like, you know, and then I'll be like, okay, guys, I want to see something by Wednesday, whatever. And then, okay, everybody, all right, break, you know, and then, it would go like that. And then by Wednesday, you know, I'll take the whole list and we'll go down it and I'll see if I've seen all the dishes yet. And, you know, we'll go from there. Okay. And, uh, and so how do you like bring the whole thing together where you said, you know, you come to this meeting when you have, you know, some ideas and how do you inject then the the dishes that were coming from like the step that you were as you're describing before, which is, asking the chef de party to, you know, come up with, um, you know, in two weeks, like, a, you know, like, a, a, you know, dish around Celsifi or dish around Brussels sprouts and so on. So how do you reconcile those things together? It would say we'd, we'd have to put one of the things on hold and add one of the things in. It would be like, or one thing would go to the regular menu and one thing would go to the tasting menu. I, things would have to switch or swap around. But I would say, you know, one th or one thing would come off the regular menu and then one thing would go on the, on the regular menu it's just a it would be a, a switch or swap process where it makes sense or if it did make sense or it would just be you know or something would get filed away for another day you know what i mean and um i can see i hear your daughter i think <laughs> so <laughs> she said like that it's uh, it's time for pancakes now so <laughs> <laughs> so she, yeah, so now you're thinking about your own you know dishes and so on that you know you you will bring into the mix here so what what's your source of inspiration you personally what is my source of inspiration yeah when you create like a new dish my source of inspiration my daughter <laughs> your daughter <laughs> yeah. now yes but you know like it's before <laughs> you're getting like the the, the easy way out here but <laughs> <laughs> that what about like uh you know beside your daughter what's the source of inspiration what you're looking is it you know it starts with an ingredients like a produce that you have does it start with you know anything visual anything that you have tasted in the past my uh, source um, of inspiration is is the ingredients you know usually i'm at the market and i'll see you know see the product or that's when the ideas start to, to flow, you know, is when you have something in, and when you have the product in your hand, when you have, when you're sm like smelling the spices, that's when the thoughts are really, really happening. And I can't imagine it coming from anywhere else. You know, I mean, you can, you can get excited about, you know, reading lists and things like that, but really when you get the things in your hands and get them in front of you and get them in your face and, and uh, taste and smell, it's, that's it. So what are the, um, some of the ingredients or produce that are like really irre irreplaceable, you know, to you besides, you know, salt and, and uh, there's a lot of different kinds of salts, you know, I agree with that. Salt. 
Uh, no, but is, is there like really things that um, that 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 they really like inspire you, and you always want to you know, to use those ingredients in the, those produce, they, and they are key in your in your way of cooking or style of cooking. I know I put you on the spot here. Yeah, I'm saying I just use so many different ingredients that are so that I feel like are so key. I really love lettuce and the seasons. It, it's, all the ingredients are so different during the seasons, you know, and it's like the one that's universal through all the seasons are potatoes, but that's so boring. It's just like everybody, do you just use potatoes just like all the time? I, like, uh, like at home, I eat rice all the time, but like in the restaurant, I rarely put rice. Well, I use rice and to make like chips, but like, I don't like make rice all the time. Like, I mean, we, we can maybe think in different, like a different approach, different ways. Like, if there's like something like recently, like unique and and new that in, in terms of produce or ingredients that now are finding the way in your the dishes that you are creating. If there's like almost like a new obsession that you have. I like the kogi nut squash. I think it's a really good one. That's that's coming. That's in season right now. I think it's a really delicious like. A uh, yummy fall squash that is just got so much flavor and sweetness, and just you know, for the season right now, it's just a really great ingredient. Just a good one. Go get okay. some. Can you talk to us about like the the new concept that you have, like in the you know the past months, like the ribs and side. So there's like ribs and rosé. I've seen ribs and ribs and red. Yes. And so, you know, like the home delivery that uh, service that you're having in from Manhattan and in Brooklyn. Yeah, I mean it's a pandemic project. I just like, what can I do in the middle, in the midst of all of this? You know, that is this craziness. And what, um, you know, what do people want? And I think. People would like some yummy, comforting food delivered to their home and not too complicated way. You know, I'd like to offer that. And okay. So, so yeah. why, why, why the ribs? You know, what, what, why did you focus why on ribs? ribs? I mean, okay. there's a lot of other, <laughs> uh, no, no, but I mean, there's a lot of other like, you know, comfort food. You know, a lot of people at the moment gravitate, obviously, around the comfort food, nostalgia, and so on. So, so why did ribs? you um, select um, ribs? Okay, why ribs? I'll tell you why. I wanted to just do the food that I cook at home and cook it and just cook it for everyone and put it in the back of my car and deliver it to you. And like, you know what I mean? And so, and that's exactly what I'm doing. Uh, you know, I go in and I go into work and I cook yummy delicious food and i cook it and deliver it and you deliver it yourself oh uh, yeah yeah oh, I, wow. I deliver it i have uh you know i have a couple guys who deliver also sure of and, course uh, yeah yeah so and what like like the different um you know because it's not only about ribs there's like the sides so are you ch like changing you know, sides like, um, you know, oh, yeah. like every uh, week or? So, I mean, not every week, but I definitely just, I mean, with the seasons, I just changed. You know, I used to have watermelon on. That's come off. I just put on a mac and cheese that is really good. Yeah, I just put on a beet salad that has, uh, that's with a tahini vinaigrette with a turmeric, fresh turmeric yogurt and watercress that's really, really yummy. I put on a butternut squash soup that is made with butternut squash that Jen and I picked from her uncle's farm. And so we have just a ton of butternut squash from her uncle's farm. And so this soup is going to be all made from that. So, yeah, we've got some really good stuff. Let's talk about like um, about a specific like, recipe. I, I would like to pick up your brain. I do that with all the guests that I have on the show, and it would be like looking at a special uh, recipes that you can share with, uh, you know, like uh, that a home cook or food enthusiast, you know, can do at home and would be a uh, Bryce Schumann style. Yeah, the pancake is like, um, it's a really incredible pancake. I, I, um, 
I would like to suggest it because it's not like super easy to make. I mean, it's but it's it's a it's really good. It's got a little bit of technique, but you can make it at home. So it's good for foodies because you know it's not just like the Bisquick. You know, mix some milk with sure. your Bisquick <laughs> and then put it in the pan. I hope so. <laughs> so uh, so essentially, it's I think it's about uh, two cups of uh, about two cups of flour to two cups of buttermilk, teaspoon and a half of baking powder, half a teaspoon of baking soda, nice pinch of salt. There's a uh, half a stick of butter melted goes right into the buttermilk, and then you have four eggs uh, separated. Put the yolks into the wet ingredients. Make sure you don't break the yolks. Then you take about a quarter cup of sugar, and you add that into your whites, and then you beat your whites uh, until they are stiff peaks. So you're basically making a French meringue. So then um, you mix your dry ingredients into your wet ingredients. And uh, that should make a kind of a, and you want a good, by the way, you want a good buttermilk, good thick buttermilk. So like, don't, you know, some buttermilks out there that pretend to be like good buttermilks, like even if they're like, uh, you know, or like Ronnie Brook Farms or whatever like that, like, like I love, I love, you know, natural farms or whatever. And like, but like, it's, it's a, it's a really thin buttermilk. It's not really, hasn't cult, cultured enough and set up. You want a nice thick buttermilk. So add your dry ingredients to your, your uh, wet ingredients and mix it until it's smooth, but don't over, don't over mix it too much. And then, uh, basically once you do that, then fold in your whites in thirds, then get your pan hot warm basically hot but warm add in about a, a nub of butter get it nice and foamy and then start dropping in your pancakes you're going to want your heat to be on about medium low and these pancakes are going to brown fast because they've got sugar in them. they've got a good amount of sugar in them your sugar is going to caramelize faster than a regular pancake does. so you gotta gotta be careful. You can't have the pan, the temperature of the pan too hot. And you're gonna want to flip these pancakes when they're still a little bit saucy on the top. And you're gonna so it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge to flip them. So you're gonna flip them, and you're gonna flip them, flip them, flip them. And you want enough butter in the pan to kind of fry the pancake just a little bit. So that's really nice. And uh, by the way, and flip them, and then cook them on the other side until they're done. Then take them out. Now, I promise you, you do this right, these are going to be the most fluffy, delicious pancakes that you've ever had. Okay. They, and they, they are they, your daughter's they're gonna, favorite. They're not going to need, they're not going to need syrup. Yeah, so you're not going to need any of that. And um, so, yeah, I, it, my, my daughter loves them. Also, I actually have a video of me and my daughter making these pancakes that's on my, it's on my Pinterest site. Uh, I think I'm at Bryce Schumann at the Pinterest site. If you check mm-hmm. it out, and um, sure, there's a- and I will put it as well in the, in the, the show notes of uh, you know on the website for the on the podcast. Okay, so cool. yeah, yeah, and the people can can um, you know get to it. Okay, chef. So thank you for sharing this, and uh, you know I'm I'm looking at the time. Uh, you know it's Sunday morning. I just want to make sure that I free you up and you can go back to your family but i just want to finish with uh, you know rapid fire questions okay uh, if you don't mind so I, I just want to know what's your favorite guilty pleasure food ice cream I, what what kind of uh, you know now i have to ask you you know what flavors <laughs> you know what oh, what gosh what? uh mm, favorite flavor mm, chocolate, chocolate ice cream chip. chocolate chocolate chips okay you're a chocolate guy okay what are like the three cookbooks that inspired you the most in your career? Ooh, uh, Micho Bra. There's like old cookbooks that have inspired me. There's new cookbooks that have inspired me, like that that have inspired that have inspired me in different ways. It's just hard to say, like what's inspired me. I mean, like the Alinea cookbook inspired me a ton. 
but like La Technique inspired me a ton. Sure. Jacques Pépin. Yeah. You know, like I have a book on pâtés and terrines from the 70s that I just like blew me away that really was inspiring. I also feel really inspired by Bo Beck too. Okay. If you could teleport to yourself in any restaurant in the world for dinner tonight, where would you go? In front of any restaurant in the world? Yeah, you, you can go to any restaurants. Like you can, you know, beam yourself and then tonight you can go and have dinner. Which, which one would you select? Maybe, I don't know, I don't, maybe they open a restaurant now in the Inuit um, population <laughs> and he can go back uh, and revisit no, like I, the I, seal. No, I don't think so. <laughs> um, yeah, no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's another one. It's like the cookbooks. It's like there's... Oh, <laughs> I know there's so many. I it's understand. Like, yes. I mean, it's like a uh, part of me wants to go to um, to Mama Dips in 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 Chapel Hill where I'm from in North Carolina and sit down and eat fried chicken and fried okra and you know and just have a have a tea sweet tea and like eat a jar of pickles and you know bread, bread and butter pickles and like um really a biscuit and enjoy that and just uh have that with my dad and Uh, I would just really love to do that. You know, there's another part of me that'd like to really go to uh, Noma. Okay. And, yeah. um, In Copenhagen. Yeah. And enjoy a dinner there where um, one of my old sous chefs, Kenneth Bong, is now the executive chef. And, um, you know, give him a big hug and uh, congratulate him and um, sit down and have dinner. I also really want to go to, um, what is it, Manu in uh, Peru? And um, I think that that would just be, a, you know, a cultural experience, just like going to sit down and have raw seal, <laughs> you know? I would just really like, um, I would like to eat, experience eating that kind of food and, um, you know, have, I think having and enjoying a real cultural experience, you know, that's what the quest is. I think as a chef is trying to create a real experience that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And how do you do that? And when you search for the essence of place and where you are, and can tap into that and share it with the world you can do it uh, and do it in a way that's really beautiful i think that um that is something really special so, and i'd like to experience that i think i think that was like um beautiful words to um you know to finish the the discussion chef Thank you so much. I really appreciate the, you know, the, your time today and uh, and being like a, a guest on the show and share all those experiences that you had with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was, it was really a pleasure to be on the show, Manuel. I appreciate it, and thank you for having me. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Chef Bryce Schumann, and let's try to make those fluffy pancakes. If you like today's episode, please share it with a friend. Please follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Flavors Unknown. You can check the show notes from this episode on the website flavorsunknown.com. I want to give again a shout out to a great forum and educational resource for chefs called The Learning Chef. It is created by chefs for chefs, and they have a great Facebook page and Facebook group called The Learning Chef. So please check it out. In two weeks, my guest will be Chef Andrew MacLeod from Avenue M in Asheville. He will talk about the importance of listening to the customers when creating and launching a new menu. We will have a discussion around salumi and fresh pasta. And obviously, we will talk quite a bit about his mentor, Sean Brock. 
I see you in two weeks. And until then, remember that people who love to eat are always the best people. You've just enjoyed another delicious episode of Flavors Unknown. Hungry for more? Hit subscribe. Tell us where you're listening from by leaving a review. And for social media and show notes, head to flavorsunknown.com.